no rich person is going to say, okay, I am rich, too bad for the poor, but this is not my problem. You know, nobody will say that. You know, even the richest people will always say, well, okay, I am rich, there is a lot of inequality, but this is good for the poor. And sometimes they are right and sometimes they are wrong. And, you know, we need to know more about when they are right and when they are wrong. When I started as a graduate student working on inequality, I started writing theoretical models about inequality. And then I realized that there was actually very little uh, data collection and historical data collection. I think theory can be useful, but I think sometimes economists uh, uh, spend too much time doing very sophisticated theory without knowing what are the facts that they are trying to explain and understand. So, what was new in, in the approach that I have been developing with a number of co-authors was actually to go back to the historical data and to collect in a much more systematic manner than uh, what was done before uh, all the long-run evidence on income and wealth distribution that we could find. These were tax records because this is the oldest uh, data source on, on income and also on wealth. So it's important to realize that taxation is always more than taxation. It's also a way to produce information about a society, which can then be used by economists and other social scientists. Probably one of the most striking findings for me was if you look at the evolution of uh, wealth concentration in a country like France, uh, you know, you see a very high and extremely high level of wealth concentration up until 1910-1914 you know, with 60% uh, of total wealth belonging to the top 1% of the population in France. And if you take the top 10%, then that's basically all of wealth, over 90%. So this means that at, at that time, you know, the middle class, which I define in my book as the middle 40%, who are in between the bottom 50% and the top 10%, well, basically, there was no middle class in the sense that their share in total wealth was very close to zero, just like the bottom 50%. This is very striking because at that time, much of the elite, particularly in Republican France, was trying to deny this. And a big uh, statement at the time was to say, well, look, we, we have made the French Revolution. So that's enough, basically. Now we are an egalitarian country. Britain, of course, is a very inegalitarian country because they have an aristocracy, they have a landed estate, so they should introduce a progressive income tax. But in France, we don't need it because we have made the French Revolution, so that's not necessary. Except that in the data that we have collected, what we find is that the concentration of wealth was just as extreme in France as in Britain or actually in Germany or in Sweden or in every European country for which we have data up until World War I. Starting in 1914, you have a long sequence of uh, violent uh, political shocks that basically transform the dynamics of the distribution. So a lot of the private wealth is brought down to very low levels because of destructions, inflation, bankruptcy during uh, the Great Depression, nationalization after World War II, the big decline in inequality between 1910 and 1950-1960 was due to political change and going in the other direction starting in 1970-1980 uh, you have political change going in the other direction following the, the Thatcher and Reagan revolution in, in Britain and in the US. This all set of reforms tend to uh, advantage uh, the highest uh, income and wealth group in a disproportionate manner. So the view that it's only uh, you know, natural forces and pure uh, deterministic economic forces which uh, uh, induce uh, certain dynamics of inequality is just, uh, is just wrong. Uh, that doesn't mean that you know, we'll get back to this extreme level of inequality of a century ago, which we are still quite far from there, in particular in Europe. But this means that we have to be careful about sometimes, uh, you know, the, the strong denial. We have to measure these things to make proper comparisons to see, you know, when these claims uh, are justified and, and when, when they are not justified. Better data is not going to make the world a peaceful place, you know, that's not going to make Everybody agrees about the right level of taxation or inequality, but at least it can allow us to have a more 
inform discussion. And I think this is where social scientists and economists can be useful. You know, we have to be modest. You know, it's not that we are more clever than the normal people. It's just that we have more time to do research and we are paid for that, which is really a big privilege. So let's try to be useful. And instead of just proving uh, sophisticated mathematical theorems in order to impress others, we should just you know, try to collect data, establish facts and, and try to learn something.